This is a game screen loading from tape. And this is how fast we can make it go with a perfect tape. But in order to do that, we need to go back several months and solve several challenges along the way. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. This is episode 100 for the channel. Can you believe it? It also explains why things look a bit different. To mark the occasion, I decided to tweak the logo a bit and make a more functional website. More info on that and more at the end. Several months ago, I became interested in why exactly games take so long to load from tape, and most importantly, how fast could we make them load if we had perfectly reliable tapes? So in today's episode, we're going to use that as an excuse to dive deep and find out exactly what happens when we load data from a cassette and see if there's a way that we can make it go faster. Cassettes worked by having information magnetically encoded in two different tracks of the tape. One was side A and one was side B. They had several factors that limited how fast we could load data from them. To start with, there's a bandwidth limit to how fast of a signal we can record on a tape. Then the tape medium can be somewhat noisy. And finally, the playback speed can have slight variations, making it harder to read really high speed signals. All of these factors are particularly noticeable on consumer grade tapes and tape decks. There was higher grade material available that recording houses would use, and I'm sure it would be possible to cram more data in there, therefore loading things faster, but we're stuck with consumer grade ones, and sometimes not very good ones at that. But for now, we're going to remove the tape media from the equation completely and replace it with a perfectly reliable version. How are we going to do that? We actually already did it a few episodes ago with a TZX Duino. TZX Duino is a very simple board connected to an Arduino that loads certain audio files from an SD card and plays them back through an audio port. The computer thinks it's loading from a normal cassette deck, but instead we have a perfectly reliable and potentially much faster medium. How fast could we go in this case? We're about to find out. First, we need to look at how data was encoded in audio that was recorded in cassette tapes. Data is made out of zeros and ones, but those values are encoded into sounds in a way that is reliable in the presence of noise and efficient to decode. The method that was usually used is called frequency shift keying, or FSK. It is responsible for that familiar sound we hear when we load tapes, or even when we use modems over phone lines. The idea with FSK is that we have a carrier wave at a certain frequency. When we transmit a zero, we change that frequency and make it slightly higher, for example. And when we transmit a one, we change it the other way around, making it lower. In practice, on a lot of systems, this is even further simplified by just having a single cycle per bit. So a zero might look like a pulse like this, and a one would look like a similar pulse, but wider. And that is why you hear sound from the tape, even if the program is loading all zeros, because it still has pulses for every bit. So having said all that, let's start doing some measurements. For all the examples in this video, I'm going to be using an Amstrad CPC, but most of the principles here apply to any computer with an audio interface. In particular, for this test, I'm going to be using the loading screen for Head Over Heels, which is 16 kilobytes of sequential data and also happens to be one of my favorite games. For our baseline test, I loaded it using the default firmware routines. I imagine they're set up at a speed that Amstrad thought would be most reliable, given potentially pretty beat up cassettes after a lot of use. In other words, this is the worst possible case. And in this particular case, the screen loads in 142 seconds, which is a rate of 0.923 kilobits per second. Built into the Amstrad firmware, there's an option to use a higher recording speed. The manual says it's 2000 baud's as opposed to the 1000 baud of the standard speed. If we turn that one on, the same data is loaded in 74 seconds or 1.77 kilobits per second. And that makes sense because it's almost, but not quite, half the time of the first case because the data bits were twice as fast, but the initial sync in tone was probably the same duration. Okay, we're starting to get somewhere. Can we go faster with a physical tape? You bet we can. Let's have a look at how fast the screen loads in the official Head Over Heels tape release of this game. This one is using the speed lock loading protection scheme. You can tell that by the patterns this place in the border while loading, as well as by the text and the code proudly announcing that. This loading mechanism skips the firmware completely, and it provides its own custom code to load the data as quickly as possible. And in this case, it took 59 seconds to load the screen, or 2.22 kilobits per second, which is definitely an improvement over the fast firmware option. I believe this might be in the upper range for the fastest possible way to load data on a physical consumer grade cassette with normal tape players. The reason for that is that game publishers at the time had two very strong motivations to make their games load as fast as possible. 
The first one is that by having their game load quickly, they offered a better experience to the end user, although maybe that wasn't a very strong motivation. But the better motivation is that by maxing out how much data they pack in the tape, they make it harder for people to casually copy tapes using the typical dual tape decks. They were really trying to find the sweet spot of making their recordings made with professional equipment reliable enough, but making it so home equipment didn't have the fidelity to be able to make perfect copies of them. So I really think that we couldn't make things load much faster than this given the same equipment. But now, if we get rid of the tape medium completely and switch to something digital like a TCX Duino, how fast can we possibly go? A device like TCX Duino generates a perfect digital signal, but it is still encoded in the same way as a regular audio signal from the cassette deck, because the goal is to trick computers into thinking they are listening to a cassette playback. But the TCX Duino isn't just playing back a recording of an audio signal. Instead, it reads files of TCX format or other similar formats. Those files contain the information on how to generate correct audio signals rather than the audio signals themselves. For example, the TZX file for a particular game will be broken down into several blocks. For each of those blocks, the file will specify which type of block it is, the specific parameters for that block, and then all the data to be sent as part of that block. There are actually lots of different block types in the TZX format that we're not going to get into. For now, we're going to focus on block type hex 14, which is called the pure data block. The first parameter determines how long a 0-bit pulse is, and the second one, how long a 1-bit pulse is. These are the ones that are going to control how fast the audio data is going to be generated by the Arduino for this block. So let's open up the DCX file for our test game, Head Over Heels. This is actually a CDT file, but it's the same format as TCX. It just uses CDT to indicate that it's data intended for an Amstrad CPC instead of a ZX Spectrum. Just looking at the raw data is a bit confusing because there's just multiple blocks involved before getting to the loading screen. A tool like this online CDT viewer helps quite a bit to make sense out of it. And now we clearly see that there are different blocks, and the one in particular we care about is this one. So let's put the hex editor side by side, and here we can see the beginning of the block. It starts with hex 14 because that's the data type of the block. And right here we have the zero pulse length and the one pulse length. The units of that length are in T states, which are Z80 clock ticks. It's actually using a fixed 3.5 MHz frequency as a reference instead of the 4 MHz frequency of the Amstrad CPC, since it was originally developed on the ZX Spectra. So that means that each unit of time for those pulses is about 0.286 microseconds. So let's try an experiment. I'm going to change the length of those pulses by half directly in the hex editor. I'll just cut their most significant byte from 2 to 1 and 4 to 2. And then when we try to load that, what happened here? Why did it fail? If you listen to the sound generated by the TCX Duino for the new CDT file, you can tell it's faster than the one before. So it seems that the sound is being generated correctly. The problem is with the loading code. In order to load data at a certain speed, the code in charge of reading the data also needs to be prepared to read it at that speed, or at least at a range of speeds. Let's have a look at what that code looks like. On the Amstrad CPC, the cassette data is connected to the PPI, specifically to bit 7 of port B. In order to read port B, we need to perform an IN operation on address F500, and looking at bit 7, it gives us the value of whatever is currently being read from the cassette. And that brings up one of the main issues when reading from tape. The reading operation is totally asynchronous. There is no separate clock or sync signal to let us know when there's a new bit ready. Instead, we need to keep reading until we detect the change ourselves. Since every bit, whether it's a 0 or a 1, will be encoded as a pulse, our code is going to look for transitions from 0 to 1 and back to 0, and then time how long the high pulse was. If it was over a certain threshold, we consider that a digital 1. Otherwise, we consider a digital 0. And that's the basis of how cassette reading code works. And here's what the code that reads a bit looks like in a real turbo loader. This one was written by user Matahari, but most turbo loaders looked very similar. There are several interesting things in here. The first part waits until there's a transition to a high level. And the second part waits until there's a transition down again, counting the amount of times we execute that loop. Also notice that to exit a loop, we need to detect the new level three times in a row. That looks really weird, but it must have been done that way to prevent noise on the tape from accidentally triggering the state transition when it wasn't supposed to. The return value of this function is the number of times the code looped while detecting the high pulse. 
The code that called that function can then compare the return value to some constant. If the value was lower, the bit read was a zero. If higher, the bit was a one. And that is why you can't just increase the speed of the data without changing the loader. To be fair, loading code can be, and often is, smarter than that. Remember how each block usually starts with a long pilot pulse? That is often used by the loading code to figure out how fast the following data is going to be. So anyway, let's make our own loader. We're going to start with the same code, but simplify it even further. Since we have a reliable medium, let's get rid of the redundant checks for a state transition. Also, we want things as fast as possible, so I'm going to get rid of all the border coloring tricks. And that leaves us just with that, nice and simple. And to load a whole byte is just like this. If you're wondering why we're checking the return value against zero, that's because this bit of code is using self-modifying code. Yes, I know some people hate it, but this is a really tight loop, and here it makes a lot of sense to use that technique. The idea is that the average value we get for the initial pilot pulse is copied exactly there, so it's not really comparing against zero, but against the average value that we just wrote in that memory location. To test it, we can use the CDT file from the original game because it has many blocks and weird things for copy protection, so we're just going to generate our own CDT. That will also make it easier to experiment later with different timings. For that, I just created a very simple Python program that creates the correct header for the CDT, a couple sync impulses, and adds the screen data. Initially, we're going to do this with similar timings to the original turbo load, and let's see how long it takes. Okay, that was 59 seconds, just like the real turbo loader. Now, let's try speeding it up to a pulse of 300 T states wide. And now to 150. And now to 100. And to 90. Wow, that was quite a run. It failed at 90, but it worked all the way to 100 T states and loaded in nine seconds. That is 14.6 kilobits per second, which is 15 times faster than our slowest worst case. So, why did it stop working at 90? It's hard to say. Up until now, I've been using an emulator for ease of development and testing. It's possible that its CDT playback doesn't handle values that small, or it's possible that our Z80 code can't keep up with the CDT playback, or even that the emulator has a slight delay between the two and things get out of sync. As a matter of fact, this loader doesn't even work in other emulators, so who knows? But the goal wasn't to get it working on an emulator, but on a real machine. So that's the next step. And that's also where theory started meeting the real world. It's time to bring it all together. On the TZX Duino, I'll select the screen at the same speed as the original tape. I'm using this DDI5 to easily load the loader program from a USB stick. And after it loads, off we go. And it looks like the screen is loading perfectly fine. Okay, that was no surprise though. If the cassette can load it that fast, I sure hope our improved system can do that too. So let's go faster. Let's pick the version with 300T states and... Uh-oh, what's going on in here? It's clearly loading the screen, but it looks really weird. Actually, thinking about it, it looks like all the data has been shifted by a bit or two, which explains why we're seeing mostly the correct shape, but the colors are all off. It's good that we've been using the same screen as a sample test all along, but when something goes wrong, we need even simpler data to see what's happening. So I made this new script that generates a CDT file, but instead of filling it with data from our test screen, it fills it with 16 kilobytes of the byte 53 hex. Why that number? Because its bit pattern is 01010011, which will let us easily see if we're generating the correct audio signal or if we're skipping any bits, if it had been all ones or even alternating ones and zeros, we may not have noticed if we skip some bits. Okay, so let's measure the test pattern directly from the TZX Duino. So let's start with the pattern with 500 T states, something nice and slow, and we're not gonna hear anything. We're just going to see the signal. Yeah, there you go. So here we see exactly the pattern that I sent, which is 01010011. So that's perfect. And if we zoom way out, Everything is fine, it's just continuously doing that pattern. So let's try the pattern 300. So this is 300 T states. This is the speed at which it didn't load on the Amstrad. We got some kind of garbage pattern instead. And so, let's see, uh, we need to zoom in more because this is faster, so that makes sense. And here we have again, let's see, we have 01010011. So that's perfect. 
So let's play something a little faster now. This is a hundred T states, which we saw worked perfectly fine on the emulator. And yeah, that looks good. Oh, look at that. It's generating the pattern all along and then it stops every so often. So I think what's happening is that this is so fast that the firmware of the Arduino, for whatever reason, is not able to keep up with it. And it gets to places where it doesn't generate a signal. And I imagine the 50 is completely gone. Let's see. Oh yeah, that is that is mostly stopped, it's just pulses. Oh, you can even tell in the display that it's just stuck or it's moving really slowly, even though it's supposed to be really fast. So clearly this is too fast for it. It looks like there's something with the TZX doing a firmware that doesn't like fast CDT files like these ones we're creating. Technically, there should be nothing preventing the Arduino from generating signals that are much faster than this, so we're not anywhere near its limits. In particular, this is using the Max Duino firmware. Fortunately, Max Duino is fully open source, so I spent a while learning my way around the Max Duino firmware and uh, yeah, it's messy. Don't get me wrong, I'm still glad it's open source, but you can tell there's been things piled on it since it started as TZX Duino many years ago. The main problem was the way timings were handled. When the code wants to generate a pulse, it sets a timer to call the function wave2. Even at 100 T states, the period of a zero bit pulse is 25 microseconds. So the timer should be able to handle that no problem. And yet it seems that it gets stuck and it pauses as soon as we try to play some fast CDT files. I'm sure I'll end up making a custom firmware eventually, but for now I made a quick fix that improves things a little bit at higher speeds, but it's certainly not a permanent fix. Let's jump straight into the pattern 100 and see if we get yeah, so we don't have any of those gaps anymore. That's great. Oh, did I see one? I think I saw one. 100 is not gonna work, but probably 300, which is the one that before looked okay, but didn't really load, would probably be completely fine and maybe even 200. Let's try. Yeah, so 300, like before, is totally solid. So clearly that's not the correct fix. That was just a way of that I improved it a tiny little bit. And what does the pattern 50 look like right now? So it looks way better, but again, those gaps show up. Remember before this was just spikes. So this is this is definitely way better, but this would still not work. One way to narrow down the cost of the problem with the Arduino stalling is to make a simpler callback function. So I'm going to modify it to toggle the output bit very quickly every five microseconds, but not do any SD card reads. So let's try this with the just the test pattern inside the firmware, and it shouldn't even matter what I select. It's always going to output a square wave signal of only five microseconds wide. So let's see if that works. And there you go. No pauses or anything. Is, is this five microseconds? Let's actually measure it. It's actually more than five microseconds. That's like seven microseconds. So there's probably some overhead in the callback itself, which we don't care about. I don't care so much about this being exactly the time that I tell it. I just want it to be reliable and not pause and um, mess up the data like it was doing before. Okay, this tells me the Arduino is able to keep up with this, with what we need. It looks like the problem is the interaction between the reading of the data from the SD card and the timer callback. Okay, so time to try this slightly improved firmware on the Amstrad. We'll try loading the screen at 300 T states again, and it seems to be loading correctly this time. Yes, it loaded fine. Can we go faster? Let's try 200 T states. Oh, it failed right away. And not only that, but listen, it doesn't even sound right. Let me get the microphone closer to the computer so you can hear it. Yeah, that's not right. And what if we try something faster like 100 T states? Oh wow, the sound just disappears completely. Clearly that's not going to work that way. This is probably happening because of the circuitry in the audio path. If you remember from a previous video when we added the audio in jack, 
the input signal is connected right before a couple op amps, and one of them is even set up with a feedback loop. So I'm thinking that our signal at this point is too fast and it gets distorted or even completely obliterated by that processing. To understand what's going on with the signal, I set it up so that we can play the signal from the TZX Duino into the Amstrad CPC. And we're not gonna try to load it this time. We're just going to look at the signal that actually gets to this connector here, which is directly connected to the PPI, and that's where the signal is then analyzed. That's where we read it from when we do an in uh, function. So I'm gonna start playing the pattern, just so we can see the regular bit pattern, with 300 T states, and it should be there. There we go. So if we do a single capture, first of all, you see that it's not completely square anymore. It was more square at the source, at the Arduino, than it is here. Signals are a little slanted, but we, we see the recognizable 00110101, so that's good. Now, instead of the 300, let's try loading, for example, pattern 100. And you can, you can tell already because there's no sound. That is what it looks like. The RC circuit in the audio processing, those amplifiers that we saw before and things like that, are completely destroying the signal because it's so fast. What about the 200? So that might be readable, but I'm not sure it's doing the right thing. And I mean, there's variations between some of them, so it may just not be able to correctly read that data at 200. I could try moving the point of the audio input to a different location, after the op amps, for example, but we saw in another episode that doing that had its share of problems. Besides, that might work for this Amstrad because it has the audio mod, but it wouldn't work for other computers or even an Amstrad CPC 6128 that have a real cassette port because it will have all that audio processing circuitry there. So instead, we're going to bypass all of that and use a different port that doesn't have any processing built in. Ideally, it should be an input pin that is connected directly into the PPI with nothing in the middle. And looking through the schematics, bingo! It looks like the BZ signal for the printer is exactly what we need. As a bonus, it's exposed through the printer connector, so we don't even need to open up the computer to interface with it. That BZ signal is connected to bit 6 of port B in the PPI, so we need to make a slight change to our loader. Now, instead of checking bit 7 after the IN instruction, we need to check bit 6. So instead of just branching based on the sign flag, we need to mask out all the other bits and use the zero flag for the conditional jump. So here it is, I've hooked up the output, well I've connected this with a regular audio cable, and ground goes to here and output goes to pin 11 of the parallel port or printer port. We're gonna start loading the screen at 300 T states. And one thing that is gonna be different is that this time we're not going to be hearing the data through the speaker because this is just, right now is the printer board. So, and there's nothing set up to play the sound. But if it all goes well, we should see it. There we go. On the screen and it seems to be loading perfectly fine. Yeah, that worked great. Now let's go faster than that. Let's try 200 T states. And it seems to be working. And there you go. That was 200 T states. Now we're making some progress, but this is probably about the limit where the Arduino will start failing. Let's go faster though. So this is 150 T states. Okay, and I can tell already that there are some problems. Those pixels shouldn't be there. So yeah, this is right at the limit. Probably the Arduino is just blocking just a little bit enough to throw a few pixels off. When we were looking at this on the oscilloscope, it probably looked okay like a solid image of signals because those little bits, we were just missing those and we just couldn't tell that apart. But here is very clear and this would not be good enough to load uh, real data. So we made a lot of progress, but then we had some big setbacks when we encountered limitations of the Arduino or at least of the firmware currently running on it. But things are not over. I know we can go way faster, and I'm really enjoying this mini quest to speed up loading to make things even faster, and I have a lot of ideas on how to continue. One thing I want to make clear, though, is that if we throw everything away and design the loading mechanism from scratch, 
with our requirements in mind, we can clearly come up with something much faster than what we're doing. So what we're really doing is mostly an exercise. I find it really fun just to push really hard in this particular approach and see how far we can go, even if it's not the most efficient method. So we'll definitely continue with this another time. One last thing, like I mentioned at the beginning, I've updated a few things to celebrate the 100th episode. So apart from the logo change, I've updated the website, which includes a mailing list sign up in case you want to be notified of new videos by email, and also a tools page with some of the tools and things that I have in the lab. Also, I finally set up a store where you can find a few t-shirts and other merchandise. Of course, any proceedings go straight back into supporting the channel. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive and I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.